Okay, so good morning. Uh, today we are, we try to, to finish uh, speaking about multimodal interaction. It, it will be difficult that we finish actually, but if we don't, we will continue on next week. Um, so last time we stopped here. We were speaking about eye trackers and the Windows control settings for the MIDATS touch. Hmm? So the, the fact that you are both seeing elements on screen and also you want with the same uh, way hmm, interact with elements on screen, so you need a way to distinguish what you are just reading or watching or seeing uh, from what you uh, need to press, to click, hmm, to act on. And then we said that eye tracker has basically two main mm, area of interest. One is more related to accessibility and adding a new input modality to the computer mm, in sense of, for instance, multimodal interaction. And the other one is to understand behavior from human. Mm. And we have seen here the heat map and the scan path analysis that came from data coming from an eye tracker. Hmm? Uh, before continuing and moving to smell and taste, hmm, since we are going in depth to every uh, mode of interaction and sensory input that we can have, let's go back to the visual design set of slides. Hmm? Because Professor Corno stopped here, skip this part. Uh, that is strongly related to um, a tracker. Mm? So that's why we can also speak about that here. Mm? So for eye tracker and not for eye tracker as an input modality, but as another example of a way to get information from the user and for understanding their behavior, in this case with web pages. So the question hmm, that eye tracker helped a lot of years ago, actually, and st is still true, this, this answer here, is how people read online web pages. Hmm. And the answer is that they don't. Hmm. We don't read all the web page. When we came up in a new web page, we typically don't read everything from the top left of the screen up to the bottom right of the screen. We typically scan through the page. We have a quick look looking for some keywords, some images, some information that we want to look at. And to understand how people read on the web, how people consume information on the web, uh, Eye tracker is the, the yeah, tracking is the instrument, is the series of tool that is used for understanding this, hmm? clearly because it can observe high movement uh, and then infer where the user, where the person is looking at on the screen. Hmm? And combining observation with many users in, in some large study, uh, what these studies show, and these studies apply to desktop computing, but also on mobile. Mm, the, the same pattern exists. Uh, those studies shows that, uh, so those studies pick uh, eye tracking data and uh, for multiple users looking at one or more web page and they create this heat map mm, where again, the red parts are where the users are mostly looking most of the time, longly, etc., while the mm, less colored part is where maybe some user just briefly look at but not a lot of users and the parts that are without any color are the part that nobody look at not even once hmm? so in this page in this experiment users basically looked here looked here and looked here nobody looked here no one not even for one millisecond okay so this is Google search, results from Google search, so it's clear that user look at the beginning of the page and 
on the button for going to the next page, essentially, mm, that is here. And this is the same things on uh, a page on Wikipedia, the one dedicated to our tracking, actually, mm, in which most of the area mm, looked at the, from the user are at the top of the page. Mm. Uh, so what we did when we go uh, on a web page, especially one that we, well, both one that we never seen before and one that we are used to, but also one that we never seen before, is having a glance, is quickly scanning, looking for the information that we are interested in in that specific moment. We are not going, if you reflect on your experience on the web, you are not going to read every single word of a page. Maybe if it's a text like a blog post, maybe you're interested in reading everything, but otherwise you're looking for the information that you want to get. Mm? And so we spend, let's say, a sort of limited amount of time on each page. And the most common patterns mm, that we have, starting from eye tracker studies, is this pattern that's called F-shaped. Uh, F stands for, it's also a reminder to another things. Mm? F stands for fast. So first of all, we scan. Mm? So it's fast. But then we have also this pattern that is not the only pattern, but the most common pattern. And it's a pattern that they told, they, Nielsen and the others actually still there, still them, uh, said that resemble an F the letter F. Clearly it's not a perfect F, but it's something that resembles an F. Because the common way in which people look at the web page is, first of all, they scan the page, at the top of the page, horizontally. Then they scan a little bit behind, horizontally. And then they scan vertically hmm, on the left of the page. So this is the common, the one of the, the most common pattern, not the only one again, one of the most uncommon pattern that they said resemble an F. And again, F is also for reminding fast. Hmm? So this idea of scanning the page. Hmm? So most of the time, most of the people scan the page horizontally on the top, horizontally a little bit behind the top and vertically on the left. Hmm? And this resemble Clearly, it's not, it's not a clear F, the one reported on screen, but they resemble an F in that way. Mm? And there are pages in which this F is more evident than other pages. Mm? Here is not particularly evident. In other, uh, it map could be more. Mm? So clearly, mm, if you think about an F, mm, you see that most of the information will, will go here in this quarter of the page this portion of the page, because it's where the F has the two bars, the two uh, horizontal bars, and there is the starting point of the, the vertical bar. Mm? Uh, and this is the most common shape. Mm? Then there are shapes that remind an E, mm? so users horizontally scan on the top and the middle and a little bit behind, like an E, and uh, clearly also vertically on the left, or an L. So vertically and then horizontally towards the bottom of the page. And so these are the three most common pattern sh shaping, but clearly the F1 is the most common at all. Mm. So, uh, well, this, this is not an example. This is not a real um, uh, an F shape mm, because there is no, no content to read. But again, through high tracking studies, you can also understand where the user is looking. So you have an advertise that is totally graphical. Hmm? There's just a picture. You see that people don't look at the, the brain, the name of the brand. Hmm? Then maybe they also arrive to read the name of the brand of the product. But first of all, they look at the thing that is in the center of the image, in this case, uh, this person here and this person here. Mm? And again, 
more or less, in, in this case, more or less in the middle of the page, hmm, if you just look at, at this entirely. Hmm. So here, there is no a clear F shape because there is no not a lot of content to read. There is just one big picture. Hmm. But again, uh, the top part, hmm, the part in the, say, in the first half of the image is, is the part that is clearly more seen that the bottom part like here the brand hmm? here the rebook brand nobody look at the name of the brand here hmm? so what we see what we, we what we do is that we we have a website designed like this with all the buttons with all the menus etc but what we see as i said before we scan for information according to our own task. So the website or the application should be able to support our task, clearly, but don't expect mm, that the user will read everything that you put on a page, because they don't. So if the, the user is interested in this website to uh, buy a ticket, they will luckily look for something that starts with book, mm, with a keyword, book, buy, ticket and so there they will go through the page quickly scan the page and look at the bit of information that resemble the the task that they want to do so in this case for instance they can have a look here here and this two ballot ballot in this ballot list because you speak about traveling you speak about buying you speak about booking things vice versa if this person would like to check the frequency, the frequent flyer miles. Uh, the, the user will not look at booking or traveling, but to look for something that say check, track, hmm? miles, frequent files, points, etc. Hmm? So we need to design a web page in a proper way, but also considering our pattern while reading a web page. Mm -hmm. So we scan. So we are looking for the elements that catch our attention, first of all, according to what we want to do in that session on the web page, mm -hmm. in this case, in the web page. Uh, so they also did an experiment. Uh, let me see one thing, okay. Uh, so let me go back a little bit here. So consequence of the F shape pattern before going on. Well, the consequence is that if we want to have information, in addition to highlight information by keyword or uh, putting the information, uh, highlighting the information that we want the user to immediately catch on, the consequence of the F shape pattern is that we need to put most of the information or the most important information on the top of the page. Let's say, uh, we typically say above the fold, hmm? that is on the part of the web page that is visible in a web browser without scrolling. Hmm? So that part there, hmm? the initial part of the website, is where the information, the main information, hmm? the one that the user could be interested to understand if proceeding, if continuing uh, on on the website, or just move to another website, is, is there? The information should be there. It should be designed, prioritized, not just put together all the possible information in that page with font in like four point font size, just to put as much as possible there. Hmm? Because again, scanning will not allow us to get the information that we want. So we, we need to take this in consideration. So typically, the information on the top of the page is more visible, more lookable than the others. And as these eye tracker studies show, and if you look at, if you put the information, if the user needs to decide whether to stay in a website or move to another, if the information that the user needs is on the top of the page, it will likely that the user will stay on your web page and not move to another one. Hmm? So again, visibility in a sense of information. Keeping in mind the scanning pattern also. Hmm? 
So keeping in mind the scanning pattern, uh, they did an experiment. It was done, this experiment, um, only about text. So they had a baseline condition here. And they tried to measure improvement on the usability of the page that contains the, this text. Uh, also through eye tracking studies. So the text was a promotional writing mm, uh, written from a marketing department about Nebraska. Mm. So it's say Nebraska is filled with international recognized attraction uh, that drawn large crowds of people every year and we had 355,000 visitors in the Fort Robinson State Park, etc. A normal text for marketing purposes about Nebraska, five lines in this, in this structure. Mm. Uh, then they did some experiment, just manipulating this text mm. without, without adding images, without moving position, just manipulating the text. So they create a concise version of the text. Same information without some details. Shorter. So they said in 1996, six of the best attended attraction, attraction in Nebraska were Fort Robinson, etc., etc. And by adding more conciseness, they increase the usability of that text by 58%. So quite a lot. Just writing less text in a more concise way. Then they did another experiment, mm -hmm. always related to this promotional content in this control condition, let's say. Mm -hmm. So this, the first one is the baseline, mm -hmm. where they started the virus experiment. So the concise text versus the promotional normal text was appreciated, let's say, 55% more than the original text. Mm -hmm. The user looked at it more stay more time reading, and maybe stay more time on the page as a result. Then they create a scannable layout. So since we scan, why don't structure the text in a more scannable way? And so some keywords, more new lines, maybe a list of elements, so that if I'm looking at, uh, I don't know, the Scott Bluff National Monument, whatever it is, uh, I can immediately look at it because it's there is one line, only one line, for the Scott Bluff National Monument in Nebraska. And by doing this, so starting with the promotional writing, not concise, just by restructuring the text with the same information in a more scannable way, so with a list, uh, they got a 47% 40, a increment. So less than the concise version, but still a significant, uh, pretty high increment with respect to the same text. This is actually the same text, just with some new line in the middle. They didn't change probably a word, just put a bullet list at a certain point. Hmm? And they got almost 50% of increment just by adding a, a bullet list. Hmm? Again, why? Because people scan on the page. So if we want to look something, if we have a bunch of text, all the same size, the same width, etc., it's more difficult that we add all of that with respect to something that is more structured in bullet points so that there is a clear list of keywords that we can catch on. So 47%. Then they did yet another experiment, starting always from the, the, initial, the initial text, and they don't create a scannable or concise text, but they use just an objective language. Hmm? So without exaggeration, without saying Nebraska is the best state in the US ever. Hmm? So with just more a neutral tone, hmm? saying something like Nebraska has several attractions, hmm? and some of the most visited place were this, this, and that. Hmm? So more not neutral uh, way of speaking, with respect uh, as uh, Nebraska is filled with international recognized attraction that draw large crowds of people. 
Hmm? So still promoting Nebraska and his attraction, but in a more neutral tone. And with just this neutral tone, again, starting from the promotional writing, they got a small increment, but still an increment, 27% out of the original condition. So up to now, they discover, and we can, can, can also think about this thing for, for us, that the standard promotional content that we can imagine for saying how good our application is, how good our service is, etc., how many visitors we get per year, how many new subscribers we get per year, uh, actually can be done in a better way, in three better way, with more concise text, with, with more neutral um, language, and with more uh, scannable layout. And so they try to put everything together. They try to put a concise version with scannable layout and with objective language all together and generate this last one version. And they got an improvement of 124% up to the original version. So combining these three elements, non-sensational language, conciseness, L layout that is easier to scan, because again, if people is interested in the uh, Buffalo Bill Ranch State Historical Park, it's there. Mm? But also if people are interested in Buffalo Bill, they can easily get that there is something about Buffalo Hill in Nebraska. Mm? There is an attraction for that. Mm? So this is just about text, mm? because we are here, we're speaking about the reading content more than watching and seeing videos, uh, the images. But again, when you write text, in addition to keep them, uh, the most important information on the top of the page, but also for the other text that is not in the top of the page, try to write conciseness, with conciseness, with a objective language, and in a layout that is scannable. In a way, if you think, this layout is scannable, because there is a menu with like five buttons, and there is a ballot list with just a big title in the beginning and two buttons on the, on the bottom. There is not uh, an introduction of what beastravel.com is, how many clients they have, how many customers they have, and how many routes they have, if they cover the entire world or not, etc. If the airplanes are brand new or, or not, and so on. It's just the information that a user needs in a concise way and ready to be scanned for. So the best location to put content, and then there are strategies also to prevent in the design of a web page the F-shape pattern. Mm. Uh, some of them can, can also prevent the pattern, so force the user not to follow the pattern. Uh, but even if we don't apply anything, we just consider this thing, and we assume that people will use the F-scan, F-shape -F pattern, um, we can put our content, either text or images, above the fold, mm? so towards the top of the page. Again, prioritizing, not cramming, putting together things. So let's reduce this image so that it feels in that, in that part of the page. Mm? But choosing what you want to put there. Because that thing, that things are the one that the user will, with a very, very high probability, see a read, much more than everything else on the bottom of the page. And put content, if you think about the F pattern, but also about the E pattern or the L pattern. Hmm? So mo most of them uh, are at the top of the page again, uh, where people expect. Hmm? So where other pages put similar content, again, because we are maybe accustomed to having some content in a specific place, having some icon in a specific place. So we look there because we are, it's, it's a, a habit to look at that in that point before everything else. And importantly, not where advertisement usually go because we have like a, 
a superpower in avoiding advertising. Once we understand where advertisements are, we are very, very good in avoiding advertisement. And lastly, if user find your content in the top of the page interesting, then they will scroll down and read the rest of the page. Continue to interact with the rest of the, of the website, of the application. Clearly, it's not that the, the top of the page should be the best one and then everything else should be terrible, but the same, more, more attention should be done to the top of the page because it, it's the, the part of the page that decides whether the user continue, whether the person continue to stay on the page or move to another website, for instance. So we're saying we have uh, this like of superpower in avoiding uh, advertisement because advertisement are more or less in the same place and we, we know where they are. And, and we now are able to totally skip them. So these are three eye tracker studies. Uh, th this third one was clearly um, like a newspaper so that most of the people read everything because we were interested in reading the entire text. But even in this case, no one look at any of the advertisement of the banners that are on the top and on the right. On the very, very top, bef up be uh, on the top of the title of the page. But not even the title of the page. So if you look here, this is probably is the New York magazine. Nobody looked at the New York magazine title because they, they knew they were on the New York magazine webpage. They got there. They recognize the magazine in this case. So they didn't have to look at the, at the image of the logo of the web page, but just at the content. Then clearly it could be difference between a first time user and a frequent user. We don't know here if there were a mix of that or not, but they, you see here, they totally skip advertisement. Not one person look at the advertisement. Hmm. So we have this sort of what's called here banner blindness. So the brain learns to avoid an interesting content. We know that banners are uh, on the right on the page and we don't look at that. We know that after one text, well, a portion of the text and another portion of the text could be present a banner in some website. And so we skip that kind of information, even if that information is not a banner, but an image, because we learned that there could be a banner and we are not interested in advertisement. So we skip the banner and whatever is in that position. Hmm? So again, lesson for us, never create something and put that where a banner of advertisement should be because, or expect it to be hmm? by people, by other website. Because we try to skip that. So if you want to put something, don't put important, don't put where a banner should be. So not on the top of your title, not on the right uh, on the page, hmm? and not if you think it's not reported here, but if you think of many websites that are again text, advertise, text, advertise, text, advertise. This is another recognized, recognizable pattern. So if you put, if you have a website that has text, advertisement, text, content of interest, text, that content of interest has highly probability to be skipped because it's placed where an advertisement in the rest of the page or another page is. Hmm? So this is for, from content creator, hmm? clearly also people that create advertise try to move advertise in other places so that they can have a chance to, to get read. But then we learn again. And so here you see this example, there is no advertisement in the text. But nowadays there are a lot of websites with advertise put in the middle of text. Uh, here there were not. But as we see the, those studies, also people that create advertise see those studies. So try to, to move things around 
time, time after time. And so for a certain moment it works and then we learn that there are unadvertised and then they move it again, etc. But from our perspective that we are not creating advertisement and banners, just avoid those places because they are clearly for something that nobody or almost nobody will ever see. Hmm? Okay, in, in three words, and then we can go back to multi um, to multimodal interaction. Uh, here, clearly, this is a, an example of how to use a tracker to get information about the behaviors, reading behaviors. Hmm? So what we, we, we should remember from this, apart from the some details, is that put the elements above the fold. Text, better if it's scannable, concise, and without exaggeration in the, the nar nar narration. And don't put elements where advertisement or other elements that people currently skip are, mm -hmm. because otherwise they will skip. Mm -hmm. And that we are, in a certain way, habitudinary people. If we know that something in a place is something important or not, we tend to look at those things in that place. Okay, so let's go back here. Let's stop speaking about vision, but let's start speaking about smell and taste. So we were speaking about, since we had this parenthesis on uh, eye tracking, we were speaking about senses. And we were speaking about vision. We skipped vision for a, a lot of uh, application because we already focus on the course about vision. And we had a look at a tracker as a way to both interact hmm, with a computer and get information from users. A and this complete vision. Hmm? Next senses, smell and taste. So as, as we said the, the other time, traditionally, we don't have user interface with that smell something or that we don't taste user interface, right? Typically, they don't produce odors and we don't put things in our mouth to, to interact with. Hmm? Uh, but, but we have quite a lot of olfactory receptor cells. We have around 12 million of olfactory receptor cells on average. And we are actually able, in a typically developed person, to detect around 10,000 different odors. That is quite a lot, if you think about it. And we don't actually use that for interacting with a computer at all. And we could be very good because we, again, can understand, recognize 10,000 different odors. That is a very large number. Um, and we, similarly, are born with 10,000 taste buds on, in our mouth in general. Um, and each taste bud has around between 10 and 50 cells that are responsible for starting the action of testing something. And these cells are um, recreated, replenishing every seven to 10 days. So they are a life cycle. Hmm? Uh, and again, we can, in this case, also recognize different uh, sensation, hmm? different taste, uh, but different different odors that they stay more or less um, smell, that stay more or less constant in our life this is not true for taste. Hmm? Around 50 to 60 years old, we start losing these, uh, some of these taste buds. Hmm? So as we get older, uh, we have less sensitivity to taste. If we are able to recognize, I don't know, 30 different or 100 different uh, tastes now, around 50 to 60 years old, we maybe recognize 80, 70, so something less than that. 
and as human being both smell and taste are actually important hmm, for for our survival hmm, because it provides us very important it's it's an early warning system if you smell something that is not good not usual in an environment you are immediately hmm, if you smell gas if you smell smoke you are immediately aware that something is not going well something has, has trouble hmm? and so you look for for the thing or you leave the the house the place hmm? and same things for taste if you eat something that is is bad hmm? because it was uh, it stayed in the fridge for too many um, days months years and was expired you immediately notice that and you stop eating you don't say oh yes this is this is bad for me i continue to eat that hmm? so it's or burning food also we we have this without looking hmm, without hearing we recognize to smell and taste a lot of things that are can be unharm for us hmm? so they actually work as an early warning system for our life hmm? uh, and again we are currently traditionally not using any of them and still we are not hmm? but and this is more part of, of research uh, there is I mentioned to you uh, the other time there is um, a, a kind of research uh, this is something done at in the UK it was University of Sussex, now is uh, UCL, that stands from University of Central London. Uh, there is, for instance, there a group that works on multisensory interaction. And they did this thing here. So since for smell, we know that it's an uh, early sensory, early warning, they put it in a car. So here it's, it's in a simulator, clearly, but this thing mm, emits some uh, odor. So when something happens in the car, in the environment, something dangerous, it emits an odor and they, they show, mm, so they deliver different scent to car drivers to indicate danger or point of interest. Oh, look, there is something there watch that or you were looking for a mcdonald there is one there mm. but without putting yet another things on the dashboard of the of the car or on the screen on the car or on the phone of the user mm. just with shant with an odor mm. and they find that this actually worked quite well in the car for a driver mm. and so this is, was a uh, a way to say okay I have a user interface in the car and in the car there is actually a very complex um, it's a complex environment because the driver should be attentive to what is happening on the street not on, on what is happening on the media player in the car primarily hmm? otherwise bad things can happen hmm? if the driver is too distracted so since we have a lot of senses they, they thought something like since we had a lot of senses and since the vision part while driving is already overloaded because we have to look at the car we, uh, at, the, uh, at the road we have to look at the speed we have to look at the phone maybe there is some indication on the car itself and then etc and also the hearing could be uh, busy because there is some music, there are people that speak, there is a, uh, somebody that is calling by phone uh, with, with Viva Vo with, without having the phone clearly in the hand, um, with speakers. So there is also that is already busy that, that sense, why not using a sense that is clearly, that was naturally done for, that we use for early warning, and they did that. And again, did actually work. So all, all of these, this is still a research. So there is, no, there is not yet a commercial product for this. 
for adding smell to the to a computer to an interface mm -hmm. but they actually uh, did that this was uh, something done in 2017 uh, if I don't remember bad there is um, a follow-up of this more recently and the this person here the last one the least this Mariana Hobrist um, it's, it's actually uh, had a big fund for the European Union to work on multi-sensory interaction and so they are together with this Emanuela Maggioni that is clearly Italian as the name but she's working in the UK um, they have they also have a startup for multi-sensory interaction so they are building now products for doing this thing mm -hmm. so product that you can plug on your computer and use it mm -hmm. but this is something that is happening now in 2021 early 2022 mm -hmm. so this is something very very new mm -hmm. but there is there are some some cases in which smell can be used mm -hmm. so clearly why smell can be used in a car quite quite well to you instead of in a park because it's yeah it's closed it's, it's small so if you have an odor in a car you, you keep that for a while because the car is closed and it's a closed environment to do the same in a open space you probably need much more than a thing small like this to emit odors and actually there are some also not related to warning to warning system there are some cars high level cars uh, like mercedes or something like that that have a smell emitter in their premium version not for warning just for uh, uh, putting some good smell in the car so that you can buy the perfumes hmm, of the toilet let's say for the car and they will produce this odor for a more comfortable and nice uh, travel in your brand new high-level luxury car hmm. so it's not clearly a user not something for interaction but some cars already have the system to emit smells to emit odors just for pleasure or laser activities not for actual interaction with the car but they already have technology to do that hmm? it, it probably the link with the interaction link is missing hmm? what we do with, with those is missing hmm? so this is an example um, another example always from the same people hmm? um, because it's the same multi-sensory project they also did something for taste so consider this to do this kind of thing here and also the previous one it's not something that a computer engineer a computer scientist do alone hmm? uh, this person built a team of people that knows about chemistry that know about biology they know about informatics the computer science they know about electronic device they know about mechanics hmm? because they really need a multidisciplinary team to understand which smell is the best one in this moment hmm? how this thing will taste hmm? so this is another kind of, of research this is called the tasty floats also on these this was again 2017 but they are still working on these and also have something again that they want to, to bring on the market uh, it's again in uk and this is a system that it's it's it, i don't know it's 30 centimeter height um, and, and this is food particles of food small particle of food uh, that is levitating to so stay in, in the mid air uh, so this is less uh, less an application than the previous one but the idea here was to experiment with taste to produce in the end interfaces that can use test taste for something and so 
they try to experiment with taste. They also speak with some chef and they have involvement of people that actually cooks food um, and they build these things. So basically this is a machine in which food, particle foods are there, levitating, and you can eat them. You, you have to put your head, he, your mouth here and heat that, them while they are mid-air. And they did more, let's say, psychological uh, or physiological studies, like does coffee in that way taste like coffee in a, in a cup or not? Clearly particle of coffee. And they also created micro burger. So portion of bread, portion of um, vegetable, portion of tomato, portion of um, meat, very, very small, clearly. Hmm? and put there, and does it taste like a actual burger mm, that you eat with your, your hand or not? Mm. So it was more, more also about this thing. Um, but yeah, this is something, clearly, again, this is still more experimental, and, and they discover, just to say, no, they, they taste differently. Mm. So coffee levitating is different than coffee not levitating. We, we taste, we, we feel a different uh, sensation. We recognize that it's coffee, but it, it has a different uh, taste. Mm. Uh, so this is even less uh, applicable than the previous one, because mm, it's more complex. Uh, maybe we can use smell as a early warning. Uh, maybe we, we are not going to eat something from a user interface in the next years. But still, there, there are people, and this is just one example, there is not only them that are working on this. Uh, I just put this as an example, um, because it's really quite close, and, uh, and they did a uh, uh, very impressive work. Uh, and again, they have also this big funding from the European Union for, for doing this project for five years, so it's also a very nice success story for, for research. But there are also many other people in, in the world that works on these multi-sensory interactions. So how to have, uh, to, to use more than just vision and a little bit of hearing to interact with a computer system. Mm. So these are two examples. Again, very, very close to research. And, and the other example are very close to this. Nothing still very, very different. So moving instead is something that is more um, usable now. Uh, we can speak about touch and gestures. So let's remember about the difference in this case. For touch here, we mean haptic perception. So the feedback that we sense on our body. So the sense of touching. And the sense of touching give us information on a lot of things, even if we don't see the thing. Mm? We have information about the shape, the texture, mm? the resistance, the temperature, and we can also compare. Mm? If we don't see, but we take something in our hand, we can say that one is bigger than the other, or smaller than the other, or more rounded than the other. We can do this comparative just by touching things. Um, and we can also sense temperature, not only with our hands, just with our body. If we have something that is really cold, we can sense that. Or really hot. Up to saying, no, it's too hot, I cannot touch it. And this is the optic perception. And then there are gestures. And for gestures, we mean any hands, body movement, in general, mm, that we can say. So from the swipe on a touchpad or on a touch screen to full body movement uh, in front of a 3D camera uh, or in-depth camera like a Kinect or something like that. Mm. And, and this one, gestures are actually, so the touch adaptive is the sensory input while the gestures could be the, the way of interacting with a, with a device. And actually these are gestures are more and more used. Mm? Again, think about touch screen, mm? but not only that.
But even with haptic, we have some example of way of interacting with a computer. This is, again, for people who are blind. And this is a display that allow people who are blind to read through haptics the code that is presented on screen. So we said last time that there are tools that read the screen and then can emit the content of the script in, in voice. So you can hear that. But if you have one of these, you can also put your hand here and this screen, let's say this display, will change shape so that you can sense with your finger the, the letters, let's say. Not the letters in Italian or in English, and so in the, in the norm, say in the alphabet, but in the Braille display, in Braille language. Hmm? Uh, so this is something that use haptic. Clearly they don't see, hmm? but it's not about hearing. They, they touch things and according to the movement, according to what they sense with their finger, they know what is written. They have learned this language clearly for understanding the content, but this is only haptics something that they sense with the finger, with their hands. Um, well, they exist in various formats, bigger, smaller, typically 32 or 40 charters. In this sense, so they, they move, you, you read, you sense things while the text is moving. Um, and again, they need a software. That software that we mentioned last time the screen reader, that's something that reads the content on the screen and provides you in a different format, format either vocally or using this display. And then there are, again, more uh, towards research, uh, other kind of haptic interaction as a sensory mode, not for inputting information. Like this, this is called Tesla Touch. It was 2020, 2010, so 11 years ago. It was something made, uh, I don't remember if probably Disney research, so Disney, Walt Disney, that has a research uh, area together with a university in the US. Um, and they created this. This is a touch screen. A touch screen like the one on your computer, on some computers or a tablet or um, a smartphone, so it's not uh, yet another device. It's, it's the same, sort of the same touch screen that you have, but they were able to add electro vibration. Mm -hmm. So in, in the corner around the screen, the touch screen, so that you can use as a touch screen, they also added this layer of electro vibration that gives tactile feedback. So you feel, so you see here, there are different materials. So when you put your hand on this of metal, you feel the lines, you feel the cold of the metal. If you put your hand here, that probably is a, like a garment, you feel something different, more close to a garment than not to metal. So they stimulate with this electro vibration the optic senses on, on our ends. So you can feel something like, it's not 100% accurate, but something like materials in the world. But it's on a screen. So this is another way, again, for providing information. Imagine that a button on your user interface becomes uh, colder or hotter if you don't want that the user press it. You, you don't need to change the user interface. You just need to add uh, haptic feedback to the user interface. So this is again something that started in research, uh, maybe in Disney in some of the amusement park have something like this in an experimental way, I don't know. But this is something that, with some limitation, actually this was uh, quite a big table, 
uh, quite quite large so it's not something that you can put in a smartphone tomorrow uh, but it's something that it's possible to be done for instance in this way with this electrical stimulation mm. but you should be also careful because you are running electricity behind the screen so there is a lot of things to consider mm. but this is something that maybe one day we can also uh, consider to provide opting interaction at the moment we don't we don't have this but it could be uh, consider, just to make a, an example, that, that you probably don't know, uh, the mouse that we have, that we use, was invented in the, let's say, in the H human computer interaction research field, but it took like 20 or 30 years to move from a research prototype to the mouse that was sell, sold with the, the first, let's say, Macintosh or Xerox Park prototype computer. Mm. 20 to 30 years from the first mouse, prototype mouse, that was made of wood, mm. but was still, still the same concept that we use today for a, ma a normal mouse. The very, the very same idea is still the one that we use from the 60s. But again, it took 20, 30 years to become a product. Mm. So all, all these things, maybe there are research now, but maybe some of these things in maybe not 20, 30 years because the world is a little bit changed in those years, but maybe 10, 15 years, it could be. Mm. There are a lot of things that we do that started here uh, as a research. The keyboards on a, on a touch screen was experimented in size in the human computer interaction research community well before having smartphone hmm? and then when they built the smartphone they basically took those research and say okay this is probably the right size of the keys to put uh, on the keyboard and they do that they already have some experiment they already have some starting point hmm? um, well, close parentheses. Gestures. Mm. In addition to normal gestures on touchscreen, on touchpad, etc., we can have other examples of gestures, camera-based, typically. Mm. So these are two examples. If you want, there is a video. I don't think that we can. Uh, maybe we we'll see both videos. So the first one is uh, BMW in-car control gesture. You wave in front of the screen on your brand new luxury again BMW, BMW car mm -hmm. and you can by waving by doing some gestures um, answer to calls decline calls change music lower the volume increase the volume mm -hmm. so not things that are critical for driving a car but all the things that stay in the entertainment and navigation system calls, music, maps, etc. So you wave your hand with some predefined gesture and it's camera based. There is a camera that track your hand and your movement. Mm. And this is something that you already have in a car. Mm. Uh, it exists mm, more or less a similar, you, you can do something like this with a webcam on your computer. Maybe it's not really practical to say stick here in front of the computer waving your hand for half an hour but you can do that mm. maybe it needs to find the right context of use um, and you can also imagine something like this from the the, the kinect from the the xbox mm. the in-depth camera that track your body the entire body movement movement and not only the hand and you can imagine that mm. so with the xboxes for gaming so in that context, it works quite well, mm. but you can also imagine other probably alternative. And this is something that one can add to a graphical user interface now. Mm. Also web-based user interface. Mm. There are APIs from browser to use camera mm. in, J in uh, JavaScript and HTML5. Mm. So you can imagine maybe some 
something, some usage of a specific user interface also with gesture. And, and this is another example, the leap motion. Do you know the leap motion? Any of you? No. Or yes, but you don't say. So the leap motion is this thing here. This little square here hmm? that is connected to computer, or actually this is more branded now for virtual reality to be put in a headset um, for, for virtual reality and augmented reality. And it tracks very, very well, very, very precisely, ants movement. It has a set of cameras, also in this case, and it tracks precisely your hands and finger movements. And so here in the example, you see the person is using, is moving the hand and it's represented as is on screen with the same level of precision, speed, etc. So this is something that you can go on the, the website and buy it if you want. So it's a piece of hardware that you can use now, today. They are still, well, the one is in the car. Again, the car is uh, easier in a certain perspective environment because it's closed, as we said before. And there is not a lot of things that you can do because you are seated there and either you're driving or you're waiting to, to reach a destination. Mm -hmm. um, this one is, again, more used for virtual reality and augmented reality with the headset, but it can also can be used for other kind of application. Hmm? There are probably developers that use that for some small uh, things, but clearly the leap motion, for instance, need to have the device attached, so it's not something that we can all use, hmm? because we need to have this to, to use an application that supports leap motion. And then there are gestures that are not, they are not camera based, like the previous one, that use some cameras, either in visible light or, or in other kind of light, or infrared or etc. but the cameras. And then there are something that doesn't use camera at all, like gesture based on radar. So if you have um, a Pixel 4, do you have a Pixel 4? Yes. Uh, good. <laughs> so he that has a Pixel 4, a Google Pixel 4 phone, should have this thing in the phone. Hmm? That is the, it was called the Soli project. Uh, I don't remember now th if the name is still Soli. Um, and this is, this was embedded in the Pixel 4 for adding uh, gestures hmm, around the phone gestures for controlling some application. Um, but before including that in the, in the Pixel 4, they also created a research prototype. Uh, and it was like a, a small chip, like a small box, like one to two centimeter, very, very, quite small, uh, that you can add to, to many systems. You can also connect to a computer. And it sends movement around this chip. And so in the Pixel 4 is limited in a small set of gestures that can recognize, but the original version can really support a lot of gestures. And this is done with the radar technology, the same idea that is from a radar. So no camera, just wave. Um, and the idea is this. The idea is that you have a gesture in front of the chip that again, right now is just on the Pixel 4. That is not yet uh, that's not even sold yet anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have the raw signal. There is some signal transformation. And then from the signal transformation from this radar, you have a gesture classification. And so you can perform some action according to the gesture. And this again is done entirely without cameras. Mm -hmm. So you don't have privacy reasons. You don't have lenses. You don't have problem with illumination because this is just sort of radar technology. Hmm? Um, so this is a miniature radar. Hmm? 
that understand human motion on a very scale and there is machine learning in it for uh, actually getting from the signal to the, the, the gesture. And if you have, uh, again, this is the website of the project, Soli. Uh, and if you have a Pixel 4, or if you steal the Pixel 4 from your uh, colleague, you can also attach it to your computer and use it, just the sensor. They have a SDK on the website so that you can experiment with the, um, the Soli sensor, also on a computer. I think that the SDK for web applications, but uh, still. Um, unfortunately, they add this in the Pixel 4, then they didn't continue with the Pixel 5 or 6 and 6 to, to have this in it. Um, probably they put it in some Google Nest thermostat, but not 100% sure. Uh, but it, was, it, it is actually a, a very nice idea because you can have gestures without camera, with just this technology. And it's still, it's very, very small. Uh, I don't know if, I, if there is a... Um, no. If there is um, a picture. Yeah, it, it's this, a chip. Very, very quite, quite small as a chip. And this is again embedded in the, in the phone uh, at the moment, but um, it is also 300, 300, 360 degree sensing. So it sends everything, not just on the top. And so for, with camera-based system, you have the problem that you need to be in front of the camera. You cannot be on the back of the camera, clearly. This is working 360 degrees. So you can be in front of the chip, on the back of the chip, on the side of the chip, and it still work. Well, it's low power, etc. And you know, you can sense presence, multi-user presence. You can also sense if one person is sit down or still. So not just gestures, but presence of people, also activity of people. So no, not all of this is available on, on the phone. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, probably the battery will last three seconds uh, when turned on, but um, the, the chip support that. Mm -hmm. So again, see in Pixel 4, a uh, motion sense is called on the Pixel 4. Um, and I think that, yeah, see here there is a sandbox for experimenting, but you need a Pixel 4. And then there are some game with Pokemon and I don't know. Um, and that's it. So this is something that Google is still uh, creating, is still maintaining, but uh, not in a lot of products right now. But still, yeah, they have this, and this is actually a very nice idea. And there is here a video that show uh, the, the chips only in action without the phone. So just what you can do with this gesture. Okay. So this cover gestures and touch. Just to give you an idea of what you can add potentially to, and this is something that you can add now if you want to a user interface. Well, except solely that you need, so except in some cases that you need dedicated hardware that maybe you don't have, or maybe your user don't have. Hearing. So, we already have mentioned that sound can convey a lot of information in our, again, life. So if you think, try to close your eyes, don't do it, then, don't do it now, but if you want, try to close your eyes and just listen you will probably listen about the rain. You will probably listen about the noise of the microphone, uh, about maybe the, the video projector noise. People speaking in the, the room behind us. Your colleague speaking on the side of you. So you we, we get a lot of information. We know that some 
rumors are like the rain, others is more maybe a noise like the video projector, other is people speaking, other is we recognize a lot of information just by hearing, even without say, uh, seeing uh, the situation that unfold. And actually, our here again in uh, um, in a typically developed person can differentiate quite subtle sound change. We can recognize a, a noise that is increasing slightly or decreasing slightly. And we can also recognize familiar sound from unfamiliar sound. Again, unfamiliar sounds trigger some warning in us because I never heard the sound, what is it? but I am in a familiar place, what is it? Hmm? Uh, so, and we can do all of this without focusing on the noise. I can hear, you, you probably can hear the rain, the tick, 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 that is doing uh, outside. But you can continue to focus on, on your phone, on your computer, on me speaking, on other things without having being distracted or focused on too much on this. It works as a background to you. So you sense that, but it's not distracting too much. So again, sound, hearing could be a powerful, uh, let's say, source of information. It is for our life outside computers. But again, it's rarely used in user interface design, except notification, warning, and typing sound. Well, multimedia, is an exception. Videos, music, clearly they, they use a lot the earring channel for, for working. And it's really used in the UI design and still is. Uh, and, and we now we focus most on notification warning and typing sound. And we need to distinguish between two kinds of sounds. One are non-vocal sounds, like this, so something that does not start from our voice, or music, hmm? or the rain, and vocal sound. So in a computer system, in a user interface, typically non-vocal sound is used to provide transitory information, warning events, the trash bin is empty, you, you get a new mail, there is a new notification from WhatsApp. And they must be learned. Clearly they are language independent. So you have learned that the sound for emptying the, the trash on your desktop computer is of a specific type. And you've, if you heard that sound, you'll know that it is associated to that action now, because you have learned that. So if they change the sound, you have to relearn the new sound. It's not a very complex process, but still, you, you don't expect that sound from your trash bin. You don't expect the sound that a message on your phone uh, does. It's not a natural sound. It's something that you associate, a sound that you associate to a specific action, emptying the trash on Windows, emptying the trash on Mac OS, receiving a WhatsApp notification that is maybe different from receiving a Telegram notification, a Telegram message. Maybe it's a different sound. You've learned that one sound is associated to something and not to other things. But they are clearly language independent. No matter if you are speaking Italian, English, Chinese, Portuguese, whatever, it's the same sound that you have learned. Hmm? And, and they are actually useful, in also in graphical user interface. And there were quite a lot of experiment in the here that demonstrate that these kind of auditory cues are not only adequate, but also help user navigating and perceiving what is happening in a screen and also in virtual environments, immersive virtual environments. And sounds can be really useful also to understand where you are, what happens in virtual environments, because they have a starting point 
you can recognize if sound came from the left or the right. Uh, if you add uh, sound to a keyboard on a smartphone, there were experiments that then demonstrate that you make less mistakes, fewer typing mistakes with sound on than with sound off. People hmm, writing a sentence does fewer mistakes writing that, that sentence with sound than without sound. Hmm? So we actually use that for recognizing things, for improving, even implicitly, even without uh, focusing too much on it, on how we do things. Hmm? And video games, other experiment, uh, video games with and without sounds. Hmm? Video games are more difficult without sounds. The same game with sounds is more enjoyable and easier to proceed than the very same game without any kind of sound and music. Hmm? So they are actually not just there for pleasure, but they're actually helping us hmm? implicitly in a very subtle way, but they are. Hmm? And they were done some experiment with people Again, again, for, for instance, with video games, hmm? I get 20 people, I, 10 people play a video game without any sound, another 20 with sounds, the same video game. Um, the 20 would play with sound, found the game more enjoyable and less difficult than the other one, the very same game. Hmm? So they were actually useful for increasing the, the interaction. And And among non-vocal sounds, we can have clearly two types of sounds, again, uh, natural and not natural. Hmm? So natural sound uh, can represent different type of object or action on a computer system. And they have, they, they say, don't need to be learned too much because we already recognize them from the natural world with respect to non-natural sound that are created hmm, on purpose for doing something. A natural sound actually has a name and a classification. Hmm. Natural sound in graphical user interface are called auditory icons. Hmm. So when we speak about auditory icons, we speak about natural sounds in user interface. And auditory icons were invented by this person that is called Bill Gaver in the early 80 for the Apple's Finder. And then it was moved, and so uh, Apple's Finder is basically the Windows Explorer for Mac OS, hmm? uh, or Nautilus for in the Linux world. Um, so they were created there and then exported in all the other computer system, basically. Um, and they are caricatures of natural occurring sound. Hmm? So why they're good? Because we, d we need to learn them less than other kinds of sounds, being them natural sound. Uh, the problem is that not all things have a sound associated to them. Not all the, not all the actions that we have on a computer have a natural sound that can be associated to to it. Hmm? Uh, but also, natural sound could be useful because we can also add additional information to that sound. We can have muffled sound. If an object or an action is in the background, we could do the natural sound if an object is in foreground, but if it's in the background, if something is happening, we can do the same sound, just muffled. Hmm? Or we can use stereo positionality to also give the user uh, direction of where the, the sound is coming, on the right, on the left, on the front, on the back, etc. Hmm? Uh, so these are auditory icons, and we will stop here uh, because it's, it's time to move to, to the lab, but next time we start with some example from you, actually, of auditory icons, and then we will move to another kind of non-vocal sound using graphical user interface that are ear cones. Hmm? But for, for now, it, it's, it's enough. Uh, let's meet in, in the lab either in five minutes or in the next 
uh, slot if you are in the second slot. See you later. <laughs>